Hello ladies and gentlemen welcome back to the exotic podcast today we are here with a very 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 special speaker his grace chetan charan prabhu and today he will enlighten all of us on the bhagavad gita and leadership sutras do you know bhagavad gita is a book which teaches us extraordinary leadership how to inspire people how to motivate people although we know bhagavad gita is uh, more a spiritual book it is seen in a religious uh, and a spiritual context but the truth is uh, it is a book for overall uh, all round development and it is not just a book which we can only use for our spiritual life uh, it is a book which can uh, help us uh, achieve mind control uh, give us leadership sutras and specifically the bhagavad gita is very important for leadership and management because uh, if you know the bhagavad gita is a discourse between krishna and arjuna and both of them are very well respected leaders in their own uh, traditions so therefore today prabhu ji is here with us he will enlighten us about the bhagavad gita and how we can become a good leader uh he has spoken on a different uh, variety of topics like uh, with an acronym and uh, he has also spoken on difference between leadership and management and also how the bhagavad gita can help us become a better human being so he has been uh, teaching the bhagavad gita he is into spiritual practices from the last 25 years and he has also been the author of around 27 books and most importantly uh, he uh, he has a blog <coughs> on the bhagavad gita which is www.gitadaily.com uh, with over 4000 articles written on the bhagavad gita so please check it out if you are interested in learning more about the gita and he is uh, primarily uh, invited into tedx and other uh different uh, companies like you know google microsoft and also to other universities like harvard mit and cambridge uh, to give uh, different talks on uh, science spirituality how to merge uh, both the domains and also uh, he keeps traveling quite frequently as you can see like uh, he gives around 400 talks across 100 cities in four continents every year so Now uh, please enjoy the podcast and if you are new then don't forget to subscribe to the channel and like the video and share it with somebody who wants to know how to become a good leader and also you can find uh, the website and other this uh, things regarding to Pro- regarding prabhu ji in the description section of this video so in case you are interested please check them out okay thank you very much and please send in your greetings and blessings to him and enjoy the podcast thank you and gentlemen welcome back to exotic astrology i am very excited to have his grace chetanya charan prabhu with us today in the exotic podcast welcome prabhu ji to the exotic podcast uh, very happy and delighted to have you finally uh, prabhu ji's introduction you might have already heard and today he will enlighten us on the leadership sutras from the bhagavad gita so i'm sure you must have heard about the bhagavad gita from so many places Uh, but today uh, prabhu ji is a very 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 uh, exceptionally uh, talented speaker when it comes to the bhagavad gita specifically and today he will explain us hopefully with diagrams and this uh, you know wide word <laughs> so uh, please uh, uh, let us know your queer questions and comments and also please watch the podcast till the end and also let us know down in the comments uh, what all Uh, other things would you like to hear from him and also he has a amazing website the spiritual scientist.com and other books also he has written so you will find all this information down in the description section so proji welcome and the stage is all yours please enlighten us thank you thank you happy to be here with all of you today and uh, in the bhagavad gita as a leadership book is a uh, feel that i have contemplated quite a bit and uh, i'm happy to share something so let me start with the introduction yeah about why the bhagavad gita should be at all considered to be a book on leadership okay so the gita is seen 
by different people in different ways. Some people see it as a religious text. Mm. Some people see it as a yoga text. Yeah. Some people see it as a philosophical book. Yes. Now, all these perspectives have their value to it, undoubtedly. But along with that, and beyond all of these, the Gita is also very much a book about decision-making. Oh, I see. Okay. Because the Gita is spoken when Arjuna, the student, has to make a decision. And mm. it's a difficult decision to make. Correct. So that is when the Gita is spoken. So, now decision-making is key to leadership. Okay. Yes. Mm. So, leaders, they have to do things quite a bit, but more important than doing is actually deciding what to do. Yes. As yeah. they say, that, that's one of the key differences between leadership versus management. Management is doing the things right, whereas leadership is doing the right things. Okay. So management is more about execution. Yeah. But leadership is more about vision. Mm. It's like if you want to climb up a ladder, management is about how can you get the whole team to climb up as fast as possible? Yeah. But leadership is ensuring that you're actually climbing up the right ladder. Okay. That, <laughs> so, <laughs> so the Gita is about decision making. And in that sense, the Gita is very much about leadership. Okay. So also, if you consider Krishna and Arjuna, both of them are leaders. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And both of them are leaders who have risen purely on merit. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. That if you see Krishna's story, although Krishna was born in royalty, he had to live in obscurity. In fact, he had to live in threat of his life for much of his childhood. Yes. And only later he became, he regained royal, his royal position. Mm -hmm. But even after that, he actually did not take up the role of the king. Mm. He, was a, he was in the role of the a guide of the king, the advisor of the king. Correct. So he could very well have become the king, but actually Krishna demonstrates, we will not go into the story of it, but just a quick background, that a leader is more concerned about the contribution mm. than the position. Mm, correct. Or he, so he did not take the privilege of leadership. He did not uh, take up the position. Mm? Mm. But he still managed to actually do the service. Mm? Mm -hmm. And then similarly, if you consider Arjuna, Arjuna was also born in royalty, mm -hmm. but he was constantly persecuted by his cousin. Right. He lost his father and he rose to merit by his archery skills. Hmm. He was a paramount archer. Correct. By the same time, he's also a very thoughtful person. Hmm. And he has to fight what is one of the biggest battles of his life. Mm -hmm. And that is when he thinks, should I be fighting or not? What should I be doing right now? And that's where the Gita starts. Hmm. So, so basically, why is it a leadership book? Because of three reasons. The first is that it is about decision making. Mm -hmm. Second is it is about a discussion between leaders. Mm -hmm. Discussion between two leaders. And thirdly, it is about a critical decision that is going to affect all of society hmm? okay. with effect affecting all society because hmm. it's about a major war hmm. that's going to happen. Hmm? Right. So in that sense, the Gita is very much a book about leadership. Hmm. Okay. So at any point, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to let me know. Otherwise, I'll keep yeah. moving forward. Yeah. Yes, hmm? sure. Okay, so now I'll talk about four leadership principles on the Gita using an acronym LEAD, L-E-A-D. Okay. So first L is learn. 
So I phrase this as that the universe is a university. Hmm, okay. <laughs> so the universe is a university. That's why we all need to keep learning. Hmm. Now, what is there to learn over here? <clears throat> Let's look at it. <clears throat> From the perspective of Arjuna. Arjuna has prepared for the for fighting because he is is prepared for fighting lifelong because he his duty is a martial guardian of society yeah just like nowadays in in popular culture we have guardians of the galaxy yeah so one of the ways you guard is by protecting right so he has to fight and yet just before the biggest fight he hesitates. Hmm. So now generally, the Gita, because it is spoken on a battlefield, that can lead to some misunderstanding or at least some apprehension about the Gita. Okay. So is it a book of violence? Yeah. Is it a book, you know, Arjuna didn't want to fight and Krishna made him fight? Yeah. So there are two ways to get it. So one is that was Arjuna... Did Arjuna become cowardly hmm. when he had to fight? But he said, oh, I can't fight. Yes. And was Krishna violence-inducing? Yeah. So both of these, if we go deeper, we'll see that there is so much to learn. And both how Krishna, Arjuna is seeking to learn over here. Mm -hmm. See, Arjuna, was he cowardly? Well, if you look at in chapter 1 in the Gita, yeah. there his reasons are given. Hmm. Yes. So basically, the Gita has 18 chapters, and the first one is where Arjuna speaks the most, and he enunciates his concerns and reservations about fighting the war. Mm -hmm. And what is striking is that there is no mention at all of fear of his own death. Oh, okay. Not once does he mention that. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Normally speaking, if we consider that when a person is about to fight and they have sudden reservations about fighting, it will quite likely be because of fear. Now, there's a war going on between Ukraine and Russia yeah. and people are being conscripted into the war. Yes, Conscripted means forced to fight. And they may be utterly unprepared, unwilling, and they may just get an attack of nerves and refuse to fight. Yes, Arjuna was not at all like that. He was a seasoned warrior. And he was hesitant, but it was not because of fear that he might die. Hmm. His fear was, there was fear, but fear of doing the wrong thing. Hmm. Hmm. So his even his fear is, you could say this is a more selfless fear. Okay. If you consider the CEO of a company, okay. say the company is going down, yeah. about to, is facing a major, uh, major financial challenge where it might go down and the CEO might have fear but the fear could be that that you know I have bought a beach house okay. and how I'm going to pay the mortgage for it yeah mm -hmm. yeah yes or the fear could be I have 500 employees and what will happen to their lively their livelihood and their families hmm. so the fear both are fears but one is a much more self-centered fear. Yeah. The other is a much more selfless fear. Correct. So even Arjuna's fear is, reveals his leadership qualities. Oh, He's yes. concerned about the consequences for society at large. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So now, similarly, that's one side. Sometimes people feel that that people that Krishna was a god who induced Arjuna to fight, and especially nowadays because there's some religious violence in the world yeah. since 9 11, uh, there's a specter that any book which talks about violence mm -hmm. is uh, something we should be afraid of, mm -hmm. especially where religious books seem to be talking about it. Mm -hmm. However, if we consider the Gita's so Gita's content. Mm -hmm. What Krishna speaks. So is Krishna violence inducing? If you look at the content, what is the easiest way? Say, if this is person A, 
and okay this is person a and this is person b and there's c over here now c wants a to fight with b mm -hmm. Hmm. now what is the easiest way to do that that is basically the easiest way is to get a to be incited hmm? yes. Yes. It's insight. Now, how do you insight? It is by demonizing B. Hmm. Oh, you know, B spoke this to you. B spoke that to the B did this. B said this about you. Basically, show how B is a terrible person. Yeah. I was giving a talk recently, and I mentioned this point. So they said that the easiest way would be to show B some text that they have sent to C, which reveals their view of A. <laughs> so that I asked, is this the voice of experience speaking? <laughs> so basically the, so the basically the idea is that there is if you just demonize B, how terrible B is, then A yeah. will start getting ready to fight. Yeah. And we can say that in the case of if we consider this is Krishna, this is Arjuna. And this is the Kauravas, the opposite side, basically. Yes. Then, Krishna didn't even have to demonize the Kauravas. Correct. Because they had already acted in demoniac ways. Yes. They had tried to poison his brother. They had tried to burn his entire family, including his mother, alive. They had, they had tried to disrobe and dishonor his wife. Even a mention of one of these incidents could have been enough to make Arjuna's blood boil yeah. and get him to fight. Correct. But it is remarkable that in the entire Gita, not once does Krishna mention any of these incidents. Oh, yes, yes, that is correct. Yes. So, if Krishna's purpose were simply to get Arjuna to fight, then he is avoiding the obvious way to get him to fight oh. by inciting anger and hatred towards the enemy. Yes. So if somebody has to eat food, instead of eating food like this, why would they want to eat like this? Yeah. Why does Krishna go into elaborate philosophy to get Arjuna to do something which he could get him to do just by inciting Arjuna? Hmm. So, this is where the answer comes in. The Gita is not insightful. Oh, okay. It is insightful. Oh, hmm? I see. Yes. It is not a gate that incites people. Yes. But in the sense of making them provoked, but it yeah. provides insights. Yes, yes. And yes. what does this mean? So the Gita is actually not providing Arjuna's circumstantial reasons mm -hmm. for fighting. Mm -hmm. You know, they did this to you, therefore you should do this to them. A case could be made on basis of that also. But what Krishna is giving him is universal principles mm. for living and for decision making specifically. Mm, correct. And that is why he goes into philosophy. That is why he goes into analyzing Arjuna's worldview. Mm -hmm. So the point is, I said that the universe is a university. Yeah. So uh, I am explaining that from two perspectives. That Arjuna is even in the he heat of the battle is thinking. So we all can learn from that. That in life, from Arjuna's perspective, don't just act impulsively. Think and learn. Hmm. That's one aspect of learning. So if we, if we act impulsively, we don't really learn much from life. Hmm? Yeah. So think and learn. But from Krishna's perspective, what Krishna is doing is, he is actually turning the battlefield hmm. into a classroom. Okay. <laughs> no, so that means that many yeah. nowadays, experiential learning is emphasized quite a bit. Yeah. That is of just teaching some theory in the classroom. Take people on a field visit mm. and give them an experience what they will learn. Mm. So therefore, this is now to actually 
take somebody on a field and teach them that itself requires a little bit expertise. Hmm? Mm -hmm. So you could say, you know, teaching, teaching in the classroom is really the easiest. Yeah. Teaching in a field setting hmm, uh, is even more difficult. Whether so yes. we're going somewhere ex on expedition, but teaching in a field setting impromptu. Yeah. Hmm, impromptu on a setting or in a on a field setting is the most difficult mm, correct so it is not that krishna and arjuna had planned oh on the battlefield we'll have a discussion <laughs> arjuna had that uh, hesitation and krishna took that opportunity to teach mm. so this shows even krishna's leadership quality so the best leaders they like arjuna are seeking to learn and the best leaders like Krishna are you using real life situations to help others learn. Hmm. So rather than simply think, oh, this is uh, this. Why is this happening? Why do I have to do this? So Arjuna could have had the typical reaction. Why do I have to fight? I won't fight. And Krishna could have said, it's obviously you have to fight. Why are you throwing a tantrum over here? Yeah. So yeah. a typical reaction, which could have been from both sides, is not demonstrated over here. Hmm. Both are having a learning mood. Now, of course, Krishna in the tradition is considered to be God. Yeah. And that is true. By the same time, Krishna is observing the opportunity of the battlefield and using it to teach. Hmm. So, Krishna converts the battlefield into a classroom by his personal presence mm -hmm. as well as by his presentation of the wisdom. Mm -hmm. So, both of these presence and presentation, they help him to transform mm -hmm. uh, the battlefield into a classroom. So basically the leadership lessons are what can I learn? Mm -hmm. That is from Arjuna's perspective. And from Krishna's perspective, what we can learn is uh, what can I learn about what can I learn? You could put it over here from this, mm -hmm. from this situation. Yeah. Whenever a leader is facing a difficult situation, what can I learn from this situation? And what can I learn about how to help others learn oh, from okay. this situation? Okay, yes, yes. Very so that is, that is also from the, both of these are valuable lessons mm -hmm. that we can have from the point of the Bhagavad Gita. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So, this is the first lesson. The universe is a university. There's always something to learn. Mm -hmm. And if we focus on that, we can always keep growing. Yes. Okay. Any reflections, comments? Yeah. Should I go ahead. Yeah. One, one thing I would also like to mention in this is like, uh, sometimes Krishna, you know, uh, some many times people ask like, the same knowledge which Krishna gave to Arjuna in the battlefield. He could have done it you know, in some other setting, you know, with some other sage or, you know, even maybe with Arjuna also, you know, through some other means, I mean, he could have done it. Yes. Uh, he he chooses this, like, you know, the the climax of the battlefield, you know, when the battlefield is, the battle is about to begin. So, uh, of course, there are many reasons given, but uh, I, I can understand more, you know, like Krishna is using this... Uh, a critical situation to prove like you know to preach this message and to tell Arjuna and I guess that also in intensifies you know it's like the climax uh, what what would you say on that definitely see the battle battlefield setting actually serves many purpose hmm? okay uh, one is that he could say that <laughs> it catches interest of people mm -hmm. because normally so many people have so many discussions yeah. if you say okay two philosophers had a discussion in the armchair mm. okay that is <laughs> that big of interest but imagine if say say there's a world cup final going on between say india and pakistan yeah and thousands of thousands of people are on the stadium and uh, uh, there are millions watching on TV. And just before the match begins, the striker and the non-striker meet in the middle of the field. <laughs> and they start talking. And they keep talking. And they keep talking. 
Now everybody will want to know what is so important that you had to talk just before the match started. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> so the first thing is that it just phenomenally increases the interest. Yes, mm-hmm. yes, yes. That's the first point. And then the second is it also shows the relevance. Okay. The Arjuna is not a a person who is uh, trying to avoid fighting. Okay. Sometimes when a player doesn't want to play the match or the they are they are out of form and they want to break the rhythm of the opposite player. Okay. So they may want to slow down the match. So just try to prolong. And there are f- f- fines if somebody slows down the uh, pace of the match also in, in various sports. But anyway, so Arjuna is not doing like that. So mm-hmm. that Arjuna, when he stops to actually hear the message, okay. that itself shows uh, everyone how relevant this message is. Oh. That most people say, I am so busy. You know, that I don't have the time to study philosophy. But what can be a more urgent setting than a battlefield setting? Mm. And there, Arjuna is actually learning, seeking to learn, that definitely there is a lot to learn here. Mm. So, we all also have time to learn. We also can make time to learn because it is so relevant. So, it heightens the interest, it emphasizes the relevance of the message. Mm. And beyond that, it also shows expertise. Like that's the point which I was making. Hmm. That that it shows that Arjuna is that Krishna is actually so expert hmm. that he is able to use even any setting in life to learn to teach. Okay. So in that sense, there are these three broad things that are demonstrated by the bottom by the. Mm-hmm. Battlefield setting. Okay, and like when this, when Krishna and Arjuna were talking, so there's this uh, theory, you know, what was going on in the rest of the Kurukshetra. So sometimes some say, you know, the like time was stopped. Some say they were they were just doing. Well, that, I don't think we need supernatural explanations. There is an explanation <laughs> like that given. So generally, there is a principle in science or in scientific philosophy, it's called the Occam's razor. Okay. Occam's razor means for any problem that is there. We, if a simpler explanation is available, there is no need to go for a more complicated explanation. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. So that means, say, uh, if my car suddenly stopped working, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, if I can find that okay, the carburetor is not working, yeah. then that's a you don't have to go to the explanation that maybe somebody has cast some black magic on me and because of which things are not working on me. Yes, for me. correct, correct. So like that, basically, before the war, or at least on the first 10 days of the war when Bhishma was the Kaurava commander, yeah. largely the two sides uh, fought ethically. Yes. And one of the codes of ethics was that um, if the opponent is not ready, don't fight, don't attack. Okay. So the pause was basically when saw when, when Arjuna saw that uh, when Bhishma saw that Krishna and Arjuna um, uh, are talking, so Bhishma raised his hand and signaled to his warriors to stop fighting, to not attack. Okay. And because of that, they stopped. Okay. And and from from actually this was not the only stop. Just before the war, so be, be, just before the war, actually there are three stops. Oh, I see. One was Yudhishthir. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yudhishthir got off his chariot and actually went over to the pan- opposite side to see the blessings. Uh, I can't hear you again. Uh... Roji, I can't hear you again. I can't hear you. <laughs> Roji, uh, I can't hear you again. On the instructions of Krishna, Arjuna offered prayers also. Uh, so basically, uh, there were three... Actually, uh, I, you, your audio was not coming for maybe around 30 seconds. So when you said Yudhishthir Maharaj went for elders' blessings, 
after that uh, we didn't hear anything okay so basically before the war there were three pauses yeah so our krishna's pause was not the only pause one was when yudhishthir sought the blessings of our, our, the elders then arjuna also heard the gita mm -hmm. at that time there was a pause and then after that arjuna offered prayers as for the guidance of krishna not what is described in the 11th chapter but separately from that and then after the war that the war began okay. so we we can always use this occam's razor we don't need to go for paranormal explanations like time being stopped although that is also possible okay. but it's not required okay 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 got it okay, okay. thank you yes. <laughs> yeah so now this is uh, the first explain first point about learn yeah should i go to the next one yeah yeah sure so e is elevate mm -hmm. so what does elevate mean over here that krishna is actually offering arjuna a bigger picture of of life of what he is doing mm. so see in, this is where krishna, the gita also talks about the three modes of material nature three gunas oh. uh, three more you can say they are like three gears mm. for the functioning yes. of our body mind machine correct gear has its own way of functioning so now what krishna is saying elevate our conception of life and our own activity in life mm. elevate our conception of life mm. and our role in life so to give an example suppose there are there's a school with a row of classrooms mm -hmm. and there are there's a teacher in each of these classrooms which is teaching students yes so now each of these teachers if we go and ask them what are you doing the first teacher says that i am teaching this dumb subject to these dumb students <laughs> now that's not a very uh, inspiring or motivating vision of that really now maybe the students are difficult but that's a particular vision yes the second thing you ask i am earning my living by teaching these kids how they can earn their living in future hmm? <laughs> hmm? so okay that's a more practical view hmm? yeah but here it is third teacher i am shaping the minds of those who will shape the future of the world no oh, that's yeah that's brilliant hmm? now the same activity but the vision is so different correct isn't it correct correct so this is the characteristic of the bhagavad gita's vision okay that it says that our vision determines our motivation so the bigger our vision hmm. the bigger will be our motivation in life hmm. so we may or may not be teachers but uh, whatever role we are doing we can have a very reductionistic vision we can think oh you know i hate this job i hate this job but i have to do it because i have all these responsibilities mm. you know maybe my parents left a debt on me or my family is required so much money yeah. and i hate everything i hate my job i hate my responsibilities but i have to do it what yeah. so this the gita says is a vision comes ah okay tamagun okay ignorance hmm. so some so this is a vision that is unhealthy so for for one of the key jobs of leadership is to get a bigger vision of things and share a bigger vision with others okay mm -hmm. so first we are and after we then we elevate or we expand the vision 
of others about what they are doing. Okay. So now, now if somebody is especially working, say in a role of leadership in the corporate world, mm -hmm. then naturally they are going to have to focus on profits. Yes. And that's natural. But for the Rajas vision will be, okay, I'm going to make a lot of money. I'm going to live in luxury. They are looking at it. But no, this is a vision that grows tired soon. If one is only concerned about money, yeah. two problems with it. It is unending. Yes. It's unending greed. Mm -hmm. I have this much money. I'm a millionaire now. I want to become a billionaire. Once I'm a billionaire, I want to become a trillionaire. Yes. It's never going to end. Hmm? And it keeps one, a person perpetually unhappy because they're always looking at what others have more than us. And then also, it is unfulfilling. Oh, yes. Even if one gets a lot of money, because but still... No, there's no happiness in looking at one's bank account. Maybe there's some happiness. Maybe somebody's name is published with a fortune. Five, uh, this is the most wealthy people in the world, whatever. There's some pleasure over there, but it's not much, much long-term pleasure over there. Right. So, you know, basically making money that is important. But what we are making with money mm. is even more important. Oh, okay. Very good. Very true. Very true. Yes. So making money is important, but much more important is a greater than sign over. Then what you are making with money. Correct. So the so the Rajasik vision is definitely a better than the Tamasik vision. Mm -hmm. But Krishna takes Arjuna. So Arjuna is initially thinking in the oh, I have to fight this terrible war. Why should I fight it? I just don't want to fight it. And then he thinks, okay, if I fight it to win a win a kingdom. Krishna tells Arjuna, ah. you're not fighting to win a kingdom. Yes. So you are actually fighting for a much higher purpose. Yes, you will win a kingdom, no doubt. Right. But that is a side result. That is a byproduct. Right. Mm. Just like in the world, if we offer a quality service to people, yeah. you know, uh, we, if somebody makes a quality product and offers a quality product, they will make money. Yes. But they will also be have the satisfaction of having done something of substantial value. For people at large. Yes. So, yes. so the vision of sattva is that we are all have we are we are we are given gifts so that we can give gifts. Ah, oh, okay. Okay. And whatever abilities we have, mm -hmm. whatever uh, resources we have. These are gifts which are given to us, hmm. and they are we are we can give gifts means we can make a difference with these gifts. Hmm. Whatever be the specific way in which we can make a difference, that will vary from person to person, yeah. from situation to situation. But this is basically a mood of service. Hmm. In the in the Eastern Yoga tradition, this is called seva. Yes. That a vision of service. That so elevate our conception mm. of what we are doing. Elevate our vision of life. And when, if we are only thinking about how much hard work it is, or we're thinking only of how much money is going to give me, sooner or later we may start feeling that the that the hard work is too much or the money is too little, mm. and we'll get tired. Sorry. But if we are thinking that what contribution I'm making, then no, then that will keep us moving forward in life. Correct. Very true. Very true. There are times when we can't control how much hard work we have to put in. There are times when we can't control how much money we are going to get. Yes. But we can always have an attitude of service. Yes. And thus we can we can move ahead in our lives. Hmm. Okay. So that is the second aspect of the teaching of the Gita. Elevate. Elevate our vision of what we are doing. Correct. Mm, very, very good. Okay. So, should I go to third one now? Yes. Uh, yes. Are there any reflections, questions? 
uh, good as of now. <laughs> okay. So A is appreciate. Mm -hmm. So this is actually this is based on 1715 in the Bhagavad Gita where Krishna talks about the discipline of speaking. Mm -hmm. So one of the key, key things that a leader has to do is to guide the guide, instruct, inspire mm -hmm. the subordinates. Correct. And that happens through the power of words. Hmm. That in Chanakya is a great statesman from the Indian tradition and he says that if somebody has to become a leader of men, they have to be good in weapons. But more important than good you being good in the use of weapons is that they have to be good in the use of words. Oh, I see. Because it is through weapons, you can fight well. But through words, you can inspire a thousand people to fight well for you. Wow, brilliant. Yes. So, so in that sense, leadership, leaders, they have to be good at, they are good at weapons, especially if they are, they are martial fighters, that's true. But what is much, much more important is that they are be good at words. Now, good at words does not mean that one just sweet talks and misleads others. Yeah, yeah, yes. It is about authentic appreciation of others. Okay. So the Gita, Gita says that when our speech, it can have two distinct characteristics. That one is, it is sensible, but it is also sensitive. Hmm. That what we speak is, it makes sense, it's rational. So if we are correcting someone, uh, then we don't just condemn them. We don't just uh, judge and label them. Yeah. But rather we explain, this is what you did. And you are thinking in this way, but this is where your thinking is, is not so helpful over here. Mm -hmm. so, so it has to be sensible. It also has to be sensitive. Mm -hmm. and so sensible basically addresses the head. Sensitive addresses the heart. We have our reasoning faculty. Hmm. We have our feeling or emotion faculty. Hmm. You know, nowadays, neurologist talks about two parts of the brain and yeah. how that the two parts of the brain function differently. Yeah. And leaders should be able to tap both of these. Okay. So in the Gita, if you see, generally, whenever a message has to be given, hmm. The Gita has two distinct components to its message. Okay. One is that there is enlightenment. And that is what comes through the philosophy. Mm -hmm. But there are many places where Krishna speaks in a very affectionate way. Okay. And that is where he's offering encouragement. Okay. He's offering empathy. He's offering understanding. He's offering hope. So Krishna himself is demonstrating these two qualities of enlightenment and encouragement. Mm -hmm. And we all can be doing something similar. So leaders should, when they speak and they guide, if they can appreciate that everybody, even the subordinates, they're also facing challenges. That we need to, know, uh, we appreciate that they are trying their best mm -hmm. and we appreciate what is the good that they have done. So appreciate means we sh leaders will naturally Tell them, you have done this wrong and you have to do this right. Yeah. This is the way to do it. So that in one sense, the enlightenment of what to do, what is wrong and what is right, that is naturally going to come because yeah. the leader will not be able to function otherwise. Yeah, yes. But the leaders also focus on encouraging others, hmm. on appreciating, and that will be a significant step forward for them. Okay. So that's the third part of appreciate. Mm -hmm. So especially the Gita's last three words, 1863 to 66, is an overpowering, outpouring and overpowering of, overflowing of affection, affectionate concern and affectionate assurance, which is extremely encouraging. Mm -hmm. Like that, there are many examples where, where Krishna walks his talk. 
Okay. So that brings me to the, should I go to the last part now? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. So the last is D is dedicate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So here the idea is that when we are functioning in our lives, uh, this is somewhat related with the idea of elevate, mm -hmm. but there is a slight difference. The difference is that when somebody is functioning, elevate is how we look at things. Mm -hmm. Like the teacher, how is the teacher seeing what they are doing? Mm -hmm. I am shaping the minds of those who are shaping the world, shaping the uh, future of the world. Mm -hmm. Now, dedicate means, so, so elevate is more in terms of dedicate, vision. Dedicate is more in terms of action. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it is with what conception am I doing this? Why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. We all need a sense of meaning and purpose in our lives. Correct, mm -hmm. correct. And if we are thinking that I am all alone in this world and I'm fighting against this bag, big bad world to yeah. make, make my mark, to find my place, to conquer the world, then it is a very antagonistic view. Yes, life is tough and we have to face challenges, no doubt. But there is a bigger vision of the world. So basically... One of the key teachings of the Gita is that each one of us, we are parts of the divine. Hmm. And once we are understand we are parts of the divine, what it means is we have parts hmm. in the divine plan. Ah, okay. So, for example, if somebody is a part of a cricket team or a football team, hmm. if they are a part, that means the coach, the captain, whoever selects them, they have a part in mind for them. Isn't it? Correct, correct, correct. So, like that, we are all parts of the divine and therefore each one of us has a, uh, has a part. And you know, life, life is basically, when we understand this part, life is not an individual sport. Mm. It is more like a team sport. Uh, individual sports, you say like tennis or chess, but one person is playing team sport like cricket or soccer or football or hockey. Mm -hmm. So when life life is less of a team sport, more of a less of an individual sport, more of a team sport. Ah, okay. And we belong to the team of the divine. Every one of us belongs to the team of the divine. Mm -hmm. And when we work in a mood of harmony, it's like the key uh, for a performer. Every player in a team wants to perform. But the player wants, the best players, they want their team to win. Oh, okay. Now, while they make their team win, they also will want to excel. But their primary purpose is not that I want to excel. Their pri primary purpose is I want to make my team win. Mm. I want my team to excel. So, when we similarly we understand that we are parts of the divine. So, see, one vision is that, say, I am here and there is some divine somewhere up there. Mm -hmm. this is one way of looking at things well this is true but what the Gita says is that actually the divine exists Put this way, that the divine actually exists everywhere oh. the divine exists in the world also pervades the world and we are parts of the divine okay. so each one of us whatever we are doing if we are focused too much on our own individual success, yeah. you know, that I, you know, I want to be famous, I want to be powerful, I want to do this, I want to do that. Yes. Then we will, we satisfaction will elude us. So yeah. when we work, understanding that I am a part of a bigger plan, I am a part of a bigger vision. Mm -hmm. So in life, many times plans don't work. Mm. Now we we have to make plans. Hmm. But sometimes when we make plans that don't work, we become frustrated, we become discouraged, we even become shattered. Yes. Hmm? Yes. So, but when we understand that there's a higher, there's a bigger team over there, that I'm a part of a bigger vision, a bigger team, a bigger plan, then 
what if we are when we make plans and the plans don't work hmm. so we can become frustrated yeah hmm. we can become disheartened discouraged hmm. or we can even become shattered completely correct and this is when plans don't work people can even become this is where uh, especially depression can come in suicidal ideation can come in mm. it's because you feel i'm trying this and i'm trying that and my relationship is not working my career is not working you know my fitness is not being there i don't look good so many things are going wrong we make plans and the plans don't work that's mm. when we get we get uh, demoralized mm. but what the gita says is that while our it is good to you make our plans but you know that even if our plans are not working there is a higher plan that is working in life mm. and we are all we are, are a part of a divine gps mm. this divine gps is basically god's positioning system mm. okay. so we may have come to a dead end based mm. on our own plan hmm? but and we may see no path ahead for us mm. but we are never at a dead end so there is no dead ends over here mm. in the divine positioning system mm. so when we understand okay my plan has not worked but there is a divine plan still working mm. so let me just open my mind what can i do right now mm. that what can i what can i do in a mood of service right now okay so basically the vision over here is hold our plans lightly okay and hold our lord tightly <laughs> <laughs> quite often we do the opposite yeah. we hold our plans tightly and if our plans are not working then we think oh where is the divine why is the divine not answering my prayers <laughs> but you know but this is expressed at the end of the bhagavad gita when krishna says arjuna says to krishna karishye vachanam tava mm. i will do your will so when we dedicate our work in a mood of service to the divine who doesn't just exist up there somewhere who is a part of all of us mm. then we will find that each one of us can actually find way ahead even in the darkest of times mm. because the lord is always there with us and he will always help us his plan will always be operational even if uh, all the lights go off for us there is that divine light that is shining inside us and that will guide us forward so that is the ultimate message of hope in the bhagavad gita that we dedicate dedicate our work in a mood of service to the divine then even through the darkest of situations we will find a light within and that will show us a way without hmm. so okay so should i summarize or any questions comments yeah i i i remember two questions like uh, in the third one if you can like go back enlightenment and that we when you were saying this the third point yeah yeah so in this uh, as you said you know there are two things enlightenment and encouragement so uh, so if i if i try to broadly categorize the shlokas there in the bhagavad gita so so ca can we say like when krishna is enlightening uh, can you give some example like when krishna is talking about himself that you know uh, he is the source of everything like aham sarvasya prabhu matta sarvam prabhu so would you categorize that as enlightenment and which one yes for example 213 that we are spiritual beings we are not material oh. beings that okay. is enlightenment 77 where he says that all of all that all of existence mm -hmm. is sustained by me just as a thread sustains the necklace ah oh, okay this is this is all wisdom or for example when krishna says in the gita that uh, he reveals his universal form in the chapter 11 to show how you know he pervades across space and time that is enlightenment Mm -hmm. oh, okay but where krishna is addressing arjuna's concerns so the very first verse uh, is 211 is ashochan yeah. do not lament do not fear 
do not worry do not doubt Hmm. So it's like a patient has come to a doctor. Doctor, I have this swelling. I think it is cancer. I think I'm going to die. The first words of the doctor are, Ashochan, do not worry. It's not so bad. Things are okay. So, right, the first word of the Bhagavad Gita that Arjuna Krishna speaks is Ashochan. And the last word of the Bhagavad Gita that Krishna speaks, instructive word, is Mashuchaha in 1866. So, do not lament. It's not worth lamenting. It's not worth worrying so much. That's what the first word and in between and uh, then he explains why it is not worth getting so worked up about. Oh, okay. And then at the end, he explains again, oh, don't, don't worry. It'll be all right. <laughs> so that's how we can say there's a, it's like a sandwich. There's enlightenment, there's encouragement in the beginning and the end and enlightenment in between. Okay, okay, okay. And regarding the fourth point, dedicate that you have mentioned, so so in this, you know, the universal aspect, you know, that we are a part of a larger plan. So, uh, can you give like w at least one example, like you know, in any shloka in the Gita where Krishna is kind of saying this, or any specific area where he goes into this, where he tells, you know, that Arjuna, there is something bigger than you know all this. So. What would you say on well, that? Well, as I mentioned, 15.7 itself, it says philosophically that we are parts of the divine. Yes. That Bamai Vam Sho Jeeva Loke. Yeah. But it, what he says is, we are always parts of the divine. Now, sometimes this, or most of the time, this verse is used from a philosophical perspective to say that we don't merge into God. We always remain parts of God. Yeah. That is a philosophical point. But the practical implication of that is verse, if we are always parts of God, Mm -hmm. That means we will, we always have parts in God's plan. We'll always, ah. it's like, you will, so you're telling a person, you'll always be in the Indian cricket team. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or you'll always be a part of our group. You'll always have a job over here. That means we'll always have some role for you over here. So okay. that is 15.7. But again, later on, especially in 1133, Krishna tells Arjuna that, Therefore, arise and fight. A victory is assured. My arrangement is working. And in that purport also, um, Shri Prabhupada mentions about how the universe is operating under a divine plan. Okay, great. Okay. And also, there's this one uh, theory which floats around where some people say that Krishna, as you said in the beginning, you know, the first point that Krishna is not trying to incite Arjuna to fight. So, mm. so Krishna could have, you know, uh, told all this, you know, what Duryodhan and Dushasan did, but he did not do that. But sometimes people also believe that uh, Krishna had purposefully taken the chariot in front of uh, Drona and Bhishma so that Arjuna's weakness uh, and affection comes out and not in front of uh, Duryodhana and Dushasan. So, uh, what, what is your comments on that? <laughs> yes, that could be said. Now, the wording of the Gita is ambiguous. Bhishma Drona Pramukhtaha Sarvesham Cha Mahikshita Uvach Parth Pashaitan Samvetan Kuruniti. So, in the first chapter, when that verse comes in, Bhishma Drona Pramukhtaha, that in the opposite army in which Bhishma and Drona were prominent. So, now, was it that they were prominent in the sense that that opposite army, Bhishma Drona prominent, that mm -hmm. can mean multiple things. Okay, mm -hmm. I see. It can, it can mean that Krishna took the army right in front of them. Okay. The chariot That's one meaning. The second is that they were the senior most, so they were naturally prominent. Oh, so I it see. can refer to Krishna's positioning of the chariot. Okay. Mm -hmm. It can refer to their position in the opposite army. That when Duryodhana and Dushasan were definitely the most malevolent. They hated the Pandavas the most. Yeah. But nobody considered them to be the strongest warriors. Okay. Isn't it? So yeah. then Bhishma was the commander, then Drona was the commander, then Karana became the commander. So so it could be referred to their position in the opposite army. Mm. They were the leaders. Mm. Or it could refer to um, Arjuna's disposition also. Because 
for Arjuna, the greatest affection was for them. So he was looking at them. Oh, and yes. it was at that time, he, now he, Arjuna had fought against Bhishma and Drona also in the Virat fight. Yeah, yeah. Mm? But that time he had no intention to kill them. Yeah. Mm? Yes. So, but this time, nobody, one, one of the two were not going to go back alive. Oh, yes. So, so in that sense, now what it means, the Gita itself is not explicit. Okay. So, just see. Now, even if we take it that Krishna deliberately positioned Arjuna there, what is the implication of that? It is not that Krishna is controlling Arjuna's emotions. Arjuna has some concerns. Yeah. And Krishna helped further create the setting where those concerns would be addressed. Hmm. So if Krishna had taken the chariot somewhere else, Arjuna thought, okay, maybe, yeah, I can fight. I've seen the opposite, I'll fight. Yeah. But when he actually saw Bhishma and Druna there, then the stakes registered so much within him. These are the people I have to fight against. Hmm. This is like the worst nightmare of my life come true. Yeah. Uh, the very people whom I want to make proud by my fighting ability. Yeah. Now I have to make them the target of my fighting ability, target to the point of killing. Is this really worth it? So basically, leadership requires making hard decisions. Ah, okay. Yes, yes. So now, like the, those who are really leaders, good leaders, they have to sometimes fire people and under their uh, uh, and their team or in their company, yeah, and it is a hard thing to do, yeah. And sometimes the leaders might just outsource it to someone else, you know. You fire it, and somebody just sends an impersonal email. Hmm. Mm -hmm. But you know, real leaders they will not dodge that job. Yeah. You know, they will they will try to offer some good words of encouragement, hmm. but you know, the leaders they have to be they have to be face to face. With the real human costs of their actions. Oh. So this and that is what is being shown over here hmm, that Arjuna was brought face to face with the costs of his actions. Hmm. This is one of the reasons I think that hmm, nowadays when wars happen, yeah. especially hmm, from before the first world war, basically there was a set in the history of wars, there's a basically a a separation between rulers and warriors. Okay. In the past, both of them were same. same you know, if you consider Napoleon Bonaparte, yeah. he launched an attack in the... He was himself the king, he was himself on the battlefield. Yes. Mm -hmm. But if you consider from the First World War onwards, and the Second World War, Hitler himself hardly fought anything. The only bullet he shot was to kill himself. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so... That basically, when rulers are not aware ah. of the real human costs of their actions, okay. they can just see sit in their air condition or homes in say where Washington DC or in Kremlin or wherever, mm. and they can order attacks. So the Gita is saying that the, actually real leadership means you should face, come face to face with the costs of your actions. And then decide, is this really necessary? Okay. And sometimes, even after that, it is really necessary. But don't avoid facing the harsh realities. Okay. So, basically, what I understand is Krishna is trying to tell Arjuna or show him the real picture that this is what can be the maximum. Like, you know, you, you, yeah. you will or maybe you have to, you know, like kill both of them and that there is no choice. So, this is like where you you really have to understand what you are getting into and where you are getting yeah this is brilliant exactly and also exactly. uh i have another question as i remember like you said in the first point you know this this was very beautiful and amazing as you said krishna is not trying to instigate arjuna uh, so initially yes this is what i see uh, but then if i go towards the battle you know when the battle starts so when uh Karna is about to, you know, be killed. So then, uh, I mean, I'm not very exactly sure. Maybe you can correct me on this. But uh, when uh, Arjuna is not shooting Karna because he's, you know, putting up that wheel, 
See, there are two different things over here. There are two different things over here. It yes. is, we are not talking about what Krishna speaks throughout the Mahabharata. Ah, okay. We are focusing on the Bhagavad Gita. Okay. See, okay. there are different times where different uh, means can be used to get people to fight. Oh, I see. So, okay. so there's, a diff- there's a difference between Krishna as he is seen at other stages in the Mahabharata and Krishna as he is in the Bhagavad Gita. Oh, I see. So, so the okay. question, there are two different questions. One is, did a war happen? Of course, a war happened. Yeah. Hmm? yeah. Now, Krishna sought to avoid the war by being the Shanti Duta before, by going as a peace messenger. Yeah. But the point is, is the Gita a book that calls for violence? Oh, hmm? I see. The Gita. Okay. In the Gita, there is no such call for violence. That is the key point. There's no hate speech. Hmm? Even when Krishna tells Arjuna to fight, he tells Arjuna, have no enmity towards anyone. Correct. So you, you fight more as a duty. You're fighting to establish order in society. Okay. Not to take revenge against the opponents. Okay. 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 So so you are saying like what he has said in the Gita specifically that need not replicate everywhere else in the entire Mahabharata. This is what you are saying. Yes. So... Um, the Gita is talking about universal principles of living. That is the focus. Okay. Okay. Mm. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. It was like uh, amazing, very beautiful to hear uh, these four uh, leadership sutras. Uh, I am very, I'm very sure that whoever is hearing this, they would get a very good perspective on what the Bhagavad Gita is because the Gita is primarily thought of as a religious book of the Hindus or as a spiritual guide, uh, which it is none, none, no, undoubtedly, but there are so many other things, you know, like we can discuss like for hundred or thousand sessions, you know, what the Gita exactly is. And today uh, you have very beautifully brought out all these four lessons. So, uh, so to all the viewers of the podcast, uh, I'm sure you enjoyed it. And if you liked it, then, Please show your appreciation for him by hitting the thumbs up and sending your best wishes in the comments. And uh, as I said before, you will find his website down in the description section and all the books that he have written. And also, you know, please let us know your feedback on what do you think about the session? What what are some similar topics would you like uh, would you, would you like to see from him? All right, so. I will now uh, stop the recording. Uh, thank you so much for all, all of your time. And I'm sure you will be benefited by this. All right. Thank you.